keep the non-conformist oath. I promise to be different. I promise, I promise to be unique. I promise, to be unique. I promise not to repeat things other people say. with Fitz, Annie Grace, my um, probably my most famous guest, um, if you don't count Pauly Shore, but he didn't know he was a guest, so that doesn't count. <laughs> uh, I'm really excited to have you on the program, and I, first of all, I just, I cannot thank you enough for the work that you've done, because just because it's helped me so much. And this naked mind specifically, I, my sister-in-law said, hey, you're having trouble quitting drinking. Why don't you, this is an audio book and it worked wonders for me. I don't know if it'll do it for you, but, and I'm like, ah, what, what could it possibly do? What's it going to hypnotize me? You worked some magic. I don't know how you did it. I don't know. I listened to it and suddenly it just, everything clicked. And since then, and it's been 90 days at the end of April, not a drop and not even one urge. Oh, amazing. So, thank you. <laughs> tell Welcome me, tell me, life. tell me about your, how this, I know you, you cover it in a book, but for those people that ha aren't familiar with it, how did you get to that, that moment? When yeah, you, absolutely. You so, you know, my story is kind of interesting because I didn't really, I didn't drink very much at all in high school or in, I mean, I didn't even go to one high school party um, for some reason. I don't know. <laughs> and then I didn't drink. Uh, very much in college at all, very occasionally. But then when I moved to New York City, I actually was kind of taken aside by a boss and said, hey, Annie, why aren't you showing up at happy hour? And I was like, well, I don't really drink. And he's like, no, 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 it's not about that. It's about the deals. That's where they get done. Like, that's where you show your, you know, show your stuff. You present your new ideas. You need to come. And I was like, okay, cool. You know, I didn't, I didn't really have a cautionary tale about drinking. My parents didn't drink when I grew up. And so I said, okay, I'll do it. And I would have a method. I'd have a glass of wine and glass of water, glass of wine, glass of water right. to make sure I could, you know, keep myself uh, not getting too tipsy. And in fact, in the early days before I built my tolerance, I would go into the bathroom and if I felt myself getting really tipsy, I would throw up the glass of wine so that I could keep drinking and just make sure that I like maintain my cool. Cause I was very strict about, I am not going to make a fool out of myself. I'm not going right. to say anything stupid. I'm not going to do anything stupid. Right. Um, this was for my career. It was like intentional. Right. And then fast you forward a, a decade. You had a system to drinking system. because it was like, it was part of, of your strategy. That's, that's so interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, it was very sort of strategic, but you know, you can't really be strategic and completely in control of something that's addictive. And I think that's like the whole title of my book is like control alcohol because it's such a yeah. almost misnomer um, when you are. And I didn't know it at the time. I didn't, I honestly, I, I did not know alcohol was addictive. It was not something that was consciously in my awareness. I, I was not aware that I was drinking on a very regular basis an addictive substance. But if I look back, even though I can never pinpoint a time, um, but if I look back, I realized that certain things that I used to do, like if I was stressed out, I'd put on my running shoes, I'd go for a run, I'd get, I'd come in the house, I'd be stressed out, I'd look at the bottle of wine, I'd be like, oh, that's easier. Open the bottle of wine, <laughs> sit down for the TV. Right, right. And like, little by little, um, it just became part of every day. It didn't matter if I was at work or at home or on vacation. And it's like, oh, this is fun here and this is interesting here and this works here. And all of a sudden, uh, you know, fast forward a decade, I had two young kids at home. And I will say that having kids, really did increase my drinking for a few reasons. Uh, when I was pregnant, I obviously abstained. And then I think I created this whole forbidden fruit syndrome. Right. And by the way, proved to myself, I didn't have any problem because I could not drink for nine months, easy peasy. So um, when I, when they were born, it was like, okay, well, back in the saddle, so to speak. And then also just the stress of having kids. It became like, you know, it was the first time I really started drinking for stress and self-medicating with it. And, you know, alcohol in its addictive nature takes a whole different 
different flavor in the brain when you are self-medicating. And that's really where that, that switch can get flipped. And I, of course, I didn't know any of this at the time. All I knew is that a decade later, I was um, starting to buy the boxes of wine because I, one bottle wasn't satisfying and I did not want to consciously have to open that second bottle. So we'd buy boxes and that way we yeah. didn't really know that we were drinking, you know, three, four bottles a night between us. Um, and it was, it wasn't, it wasn't awful. I didn't have a rock bottom moment. I didn't, you know, do anything that really caused me to like wake up to it. Mm -hmm. But there was a lot of little moments that were just, Oh, so slightly painful. I remember one moment where my son, um, came to sit on my lap and I said, come here, come here. And he's like, didn't want to, because he said, I smelled funny and my teeth were purple. And you know, it was little stuff like that. that just, yeah. And so I really got in this mode of like, okay, well, how can I, how can I address this? And by the way, my tolerance had grown formidably. And so the wine, it wasn't doing what it said it would do anymore. I mean, I wasn't feeling tipsy. I wasn't feeling drunk. I was feeling the after effects the next day. I was feeling hungover. But the positive benefits, like, you know, it's like that idea of utility. And the more you do, the less you, pe- the, it, my utility from it was gone completely. And yeah. I just was in this position of just um, doing it and not really wanting to do it anyway. And, um, just in a a very brief nutshell, my, I had some very severe back pain at the time. And I read an incredible book by Dr. John Sarno called healing back pain. And he presents this thesis that actually pain can be caused in your subconscious mind to protect yourself. And I won't go into detail about that, but I was like, okay, that's crazy. That doesn't sound right. But he said, but I don't need to convince your conscious mind. I need to convince your subconscious mind. So you have to read this book. And, um, And I literally, uh, speaking of hypnotists, I've read a book since called Hypnotic Writing. And this book by Dr. John Sarno was named in there as a hypnotic book, one that can literally change your subconscious beliefs just through reading it. And sure enough, the book cured my back pain. And it was the first time where I was really awakened to the fact that like, wow, my mind is powerful. This is crazy. Uh, And I started thinking, well, wait, I wonder if the same thing's going on with my drinking. I wonder if I consciously really want to cut back or drink less or nothing at all, but subconsciously, like I just haven't gotten that memo that I have this lifetime now of a decade of subconscious conditioning that alcohol is key to relaxation, to enjoyment, to networking, to having a good time. And um, what if I could align the two? So I actually stopped trying to stop. I stopped trying to moderate. I stopped trying to stop. And I said, right, my only goal right now is just trying to understand what changed. Why was it that I could take it or leave it? And now when I leave it, I feel deprived. What has changed that has made this more important than it should be, especially by the way, when I wasn't even experiencing any benefits from it anymore, Mm -hmm. what has changed? And it just launched me on this year's worth of research where I researched alcohol, the substance, the mind, the subconscious mind. And about a year later, I came out of my office and told my husband, like, all right, I'm done drinking. If you want to drink to me with me tonight, it's a night. We're going to have this bottle of wine. But after this, I'm, I'm finished. And he's like, yeah, right. But we drank the bottle of wine. And then, you know, it was like you said, done. I mean, there was really just this this switch had been flipped and I think I'd really done it. Um, so I actually put those journals up for free download just on a website um, just to, you know, I thought other people needed to, to know this. I, I had no intention of making this a career or becoming an author or anything to that yeah. effect. I was just like, this is good information. 20,000 people downloaded it in two weeks. It was wow. crazy. I started wow. getting letters from all over the world um, where people just saying, wow, this worked for me too. And I was like, okay, I need to do something more with this. So figured out how to self publish on Amazon. That was in October of 2015. And then it, it just took off. I mean, really uh, word of mouth, very viral kind of effect. And um, it sold so many copies that it actually went to auction last year with the top five publishers and uh, ended up going with Penguin Random House for like traditionally publishing that in my next book. And it's just kind of been a, a whirlwind ride. And I think it's just a testament to, you know, I think the theory sound and, and it really does work. Yeah. I can attest to the fact that it works. Well, one, one thing that I'm really interested in is, and I didn't know this from your, from your background was whether or not, and you just answered a lot of my questions, um, was the fact that you were self-published and you just sort of, so your background is in marketing. Am I correct? Yeah. So I was global head of marketing, global head of marketing. All right. So that's not a small job. So I can imagine that you were like Atlas, you know, holding stuff on your shoulders constantly. So I can totally understand. I, I've, I'm from a similar background, not 
anywhere near with that amount of responsibility, but um, in video production, audio production, and, and radio, and things like that, you know, there's an amount of, of stress that goes with it, and that, w- along with my my upbringing, not that it was bad, but just the attitudes toward alcohol and toward drinking, and it was kind of like, you know, family events were were centered around What's going to be, you know, what are we drinking? What's, what's the drink of choice? Where's the bar? And it wasn't a, it wasn't really about getting together and telling stories and having fun and laughing and playing games or whatever, you know, people do when they get, get together, which is something that's new. And I remember in your book, you were talking about how I didn't know what it was like to go to a party and not drink. It's, it was such a new experience. It's like, what do you do when you go to a party? Oh, you talk. And you get to know people and you ask them questions about themselves. And it's, it's just it's a whole new journey. Um, but you're, but I'm fascinated by how, when you decided to make that change, the change that went on in your brain with your outlook on life and your grasp of what positive things came to you from that change. And, you know, for example, I was really big into listen into listen. I'm an audiobook guy. I really, if I sit down with a book, no matter how riveting it is, I'm out in in five minutes. It's just <laughs> because I'm up at four o'clock in the morning. So, audiobooks are my thing. And I was uh, thinking, Grow Rich was really big in my repertoire for a, a few years. And he, um, Napoleon Hill, talks a lot about the uh, subconscious mind and auto suggestion, and you know training your subconscious mind so that you can then fool your conscious mind into believing all these things and getting things done. And your technique in that was so subtle. It wasn't, it wasn't auto suggestion. And that's the part that blew my mind. It wasn't, I wasn't, you, you weren't saying, okay, now today in chapter three, we're going to say, I'm not going to drink 650 times while staring at, you know, a piece of gold or whatever. And it, it was just, all this information and I, and I, and when I'm telling people about the book, I'm like your biggest cheerleader out here. Um, I, I tell people the best line that I remember from the book was when someone asked you to help her be just a moderate drinker Mm. and you're like, would you like to moderately drink motor oil? (laughs) And that's the line that I think people go, Oh yeah, it's a poison. Why? Why do I want to drink a poison occasionally slowly kill myself? Um, yeah. And motor oil is a good one because like alcohol and this, this blows people's minds so much. It blew my mind to be honest with you. Um, but it is ethanol and ethanol is also what they put in your gas tank. Right. I mean, that's literally what it is. And people are like, no, no, it, it has to be different because <laughs> you know, grapes can't, no, no grapes create ethanol when they're fermented. Like it is ethanol. That's the thing that gets you drunk, <laughs> yeah. which is so funny. And, um, and it's actually not even the most poisonous part about it. The most poisonous part about it is when your body has to process the ethanol it has to create a chemical called acetaldehyde, which is 20 times more toxic than ethanol. Like it would never, ethanol can get by the FDA. Like you can say, okay, it's not going to kill you unless you totally over drink it um, in one sitting and you'll probably throw up first, which by the way, throwing up, there's, there's something that like, hello. Yeah. (laughs) Your body's telling you something. (laughs) (laughs) And I was just like, Oh, it's so funny. But yeah. Um, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. And I think I don't always love to like cut to the chase of that because honestly, when you are, if you're like me and when I was drinking, not only was alcohol like a friend of sorts, but I also considered it like the duct tape that was keeping all my like stuff together, right? Like it was the thing that was helping me not completely implode. And so to hear that it was poison really creates this level of cognitive dissonance because you're like, yeah. oh, that information doesn't sync with the fact that I feel like this is really key and it can be really uncomfortable and it can have people like shut stuff off. Um, and so that the book, if you're wondering, it's not, I would say it's not scary like that. Like there's a few moments where like, yeah, I'm going to dig into the information, but it's never going to be, yeah. it's not intended to be like this, scare you straight. Right. 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 <laughs> um, when, when you saw the, the book really taking off, um, I can only imagine how you felt the the biggest takeaway that I have from this whole experience from the outside looking in for you, what what was what was the what was the the, the first 
few things that you did before the success of the book, but once you were done drinking and you realized that you did something good here and you were, you know, going to meetings and doing your job and had you, I'm sure you had just a better outlook on life, a more positive, fulfilled outlook. What were the first couple of things that you really saw change in your life, personal life or your work life that really was like, wow, I, that never would have happened if I was still drinking. Well, it's really funny because I didn't, I don't think I ever really read a personal development book until I wrote one, (laughs) but I did start. And it was crazy to me because I started reading things like I read Napoleon Hill. I read um, Eckhart Tolle. I read Tony Robbins. And I was Mm. like, wow, these are the same sort of principles. Like how, how did this happen? How did I write this and not have read this before? But it was so cool because actually having heard some of those things, um, in somebody else's words really helped me and was really, really great. And I think, you know, very specifically, I'll give you a few very specific things that changed that were really incredible. Um, one thing is I think my intuition was reawakened. I, I feel that, uh, we were born with this sort of intuition and, and divine guidance and like, and level of, um, you know, knowingness and alcohol numbs that and disconnects us from that. And so to have that back, it disconnects us in so many ways. Number one, because if you have any internal dialogue where you, you want to be doing something and you also don't want to be doing something, you're, you're literally fighting with yourself. And mm-hmm. if you think of conflict, like human beings, we're averse to conflict. We don't like it. We don't like seeing it. We don't like experiencing it. And we don't often think about it, but that inner conflict, conflict within yourself of both hating what you're doing, but doing it anyway, I mean, it is, it is soul destroying and painful and it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's like, you know, eating two bags of Cheetos and then beating yourself up over it or, you know, drinking two bottles of wine, that sort of inner conflict. And so eliminating that really, I think does reawaken that kind of listening to your, your inner self, to your intuition, to the thing inside you, that small voice that, um, you can shut up really easily with, it's not just alcohol that can shut it up. Netflix too much Netflix or, you know, whatever the case is, you can really disconnect yourself with, with your inner guidance. And that came back in a really big way and was really beautiful. Um, another thing I'd say that was just awesome was, and this was a hard one, but I started realizing what I actually liked and didn't like. There was a lot of things, and I will even say people who I was spending a lot of time with who actually didn't feed my soul. Like they didn't, they didn't elevate me, but I was in it because alcohol was involved. And so when you took the alcohol away, I remember, you know, very specifically, work dinners were great. The networking was great. The conversation was great. But then it was the party or the bar that we went to after the dinner that I always thought was also great. But once you took the alcohol away, I realized that people, the level of conversation just devolved. All these smart people were just talking about dumb stuff. The level of gossip just increased and negativity. And, um, when I allowed myself to disconnect from things like that, like say, you know what, I'm going to be happier in my room, you know, watching a TV show or reading a book or just Skyping with my kids. Uh, it was really freeing, you know, because I think we do, we stay stuck in places that are not, not as, as healthy or positive just because we're there to drink too. And, um, and that was really incredible. So those are two that like really stick out. One of the, one of the reasons that I, I started this podcast back in August was um, to surround myself with positive and successful people and learn from them and learn. And I figured the best way that I could do that is ask a whole buttload of questions. And I called it the blathering because I didn't want to have any direction. I wanted to say, let's start at point A and we'll end up where we go. You know, and I've learned from so many people here in Rochester, New York, that because they come into the studio and I don't get to do too many uh, uh, Zoom <laughs> web connections, which is, it's very cool. Cause you're in, you're in Colorado. So this is, uh, I'm actually impressed that my internet is held up for this long. Uh, <laughs> but I get to sit with these, these people and talk to them and say, you know, how, how have, how did you do what you did and not go completely insane? Because there's a lot of stress, especially now that you're in the public eye. And I just just getting on your schedule to do this interview was was pretty, you know, intense. Um, and that that's cool that I, I'm, I'm I'm very happy for you that you get to 
that you get to talk about what you've done and you get to help people because that's really what this is all about is you're helping people. So I'm, I'm learning a lot. I've learned a lot from you <laughs> before. I, I, it was like my goal. I have to talk to you to tell you to your face or at least to a screen that has your face on it, um, how you influenced me and how you changed and changed me and what I've learned. And I'm, I'm really interested to learn what your goals are for the next, for your next project and, and what you're doing. Cause I know you have, you have the alcohol experiment, which is, is another that is going on now. That, right? Yeah. yeah. And is there something else in the works that you're, you're going to try to, to help folks with? Yeah. So, um, yeah, the alcohol experiment was, is great and that's happening now. And it's, um, in fact, like always free at alcoholexperiment.com. So if anybody is curious and it's a 30 day challenge, it's based on this, this book that just came out, um, my new book. And that project was really just to back up a little bit because I still felt that the barrier to entry to the conversation was too high because somebody actually had to be Googling. I want to stop drinking. Or I want to drink less, but I got this review from somebody and it was like, I read your book from my brother and now I don't even like beer. Thanks a lot. Five stars. And <laughs> he was so relieved and happy that he was no longer drinking, but he would have never looked at it for himself. And right. so I was like, Oh wow. There's this whole, whole huge amount of people who actually want to have this conversation, but don't even know they want the conversation. Um, so I really took the challenge approach and it's amazing. So if anybody wants to try it out, so that was the last big thing. Uh, my next thing that's really twofold and I'm, I'm super excited about it, but one, actually it's, there's three big things in the hopper right now. Um, one is I am working with a doctor, uh, actual MD of addictionology and really trying to come up with, uh, I get asked so much, like when, when somebody initially stops or takes a break, you know, sleep is a big issue and energy is a big issue. So what supplements, how can I like naturally and organically address that? And I've been like piecemeal recommending different things, but I was like, what if we could come up with something that was like actually formulated for this? Yeah. Um, so that's, it's, it's not close. So I don't want people to like get too excited, but it's coming uh, where it would be really an energy and focus supplement specifically formulated to help like with this transition where, you know, your dopamine levels really go down because alcohol was artificially stimulating dopamine and your sleep gets disrupted because alcohol, though it disrupted your sleep, on, you know, the later part of the night, it helped you fall asleep in the earlier part of the night and just yeah. different things to help people like just, you know, physically ease the transition. Cause all my work right now is in the mental sphere. Um, so I think that's going to be really exciting. Uh, the other thing is I am in very early talks with a woman who does incredible work in, um, Nigeria and in the middle East on, uh, just like social change and very specifically like, uh, violence against women and violence against children. And she actually stopped drinking with this naked mind and she reached out to me and she has, you know, what, what she's doing is already incredible, but she said, you know what, Annie, most of the violence is perpetuated or enhanced by alcohol. And what would it look like if we could bring somehow this naked mind to, um, you know, to, to this social change movement. And wow. so really excited about that, you know, thinking even we don't know what it's going to look like yet, but possibly even just creating like a, a not-for-profit institute that can just translate and bring sort of in the language, uh, really, um, very grassroots community based education that, that is somehow cool because you have to have the men and the women want to understand it and, and take it in and take it to heart. But like that kind of is, is really early days and really exciting. And it, it really makes my heart sing because if there's something that we could do, um, because it is such a, it is such a factor. I'd say that part of my research that was the most heart heartbreaking was really got into that fact that like seven out of 10 child deaths are alcohol, you know, is involved in the, in the murderer. Yeah or the abuser. And, um, you know, same with domestic violence, it's like 75% of domestic violence has alcohol and it's really intense. And so that's another big one. And then the third one, um, and I, this is just typical for me, but I get like excited and there's so many things, but the third one is we just launched, 
um, a coaching certification. So I've been working on it for three and a half years and it's for life coaches and therapists and people who really want to bring this naked mind into their practice mm. so that they can start to uh, just use the principles and techniques and we can we can teach and educate um, so that this can really go further than, you know, just just the book and even, you know, have, have different pockets. I've had people literally asking me for this. Uh, the first request was from a psychologist in the UK about four months after this naked mind was published. And he said, do you have, do you have a program I could go through so that I could bring this into my practice? And I was like, not yet, but I will someday. And so since then I've really been working on, okay, what would that look like? You know, what do people need to know? How, by the way, can I take the whole entire thing? Because it was such a, a, a like train of consciousness, like stream of consciousness, free flowing yeah. thing. Like how can I take it and pull out the parts, deconstruct it to pull out the parts that work to rebuild it into something that actually teaches somebody else. And so, um, yeah. And yeah, it's, it's amazing cool. that you're, you know, with your background in, in marketing and you know, you, <laughs> you decided to quit drinking you looked into, you know, did some, did, well, not some, but a lot of research in the alcohol and, and, and everything and wrote this book. And now look, look at all these things you're doing and you're create you're, you're getting into the mental health realm and you're getting into all these, these clinical things that you, I'm sure had no intention of ever <laughs> delving into. Like, this was not something that I would thought I was going to do, but how wonderful is it that you can? And that you can help all these people. Like I, one of the things that I do is I donate my video services to a, a group in, in Rochester here called resolve that uh, works with victims of domestic violence. And, and I love doing that. I get to, you know, work with some really good people and give back in some way. And I've found that every time I give back in some way, I get it back to me tenfold. And, and it looks like this is exactly the same thing that's happening with you. Every time you have this bit of success, you go and you do something just absolutely magnanimous with it. And then it comes back to you. I, 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 you have to be just absolutely amazed by that. I, I'm, I'm partially amazed. Um, but also just, I'd say really more like just kind of feeling very lucky and humbled. I, I feel like it's, it's this thing is like, I had this moment and it was in early days where it was like, you know, this is going to happen. Like we're, we're human beings. We want our freedom. We want control of our lives. Like we're not going to be made, you know, slaves to this substance. It's just, yeah. it's just, we're going to break out of this, you know, kind of in society, you can really see it where something like this reaches a peak to where the negatives start to far outweigh the positives and, and people start to wake up and it starts to decline. And, um, and that's happening. That's happening with or without me. And I was like, wow, I might get to be a piece of that change. I yeah. might get to be a voice in that change. Like what a, what a privilege and honor that is. And I've just, um, I think I've always approached it from, from the fact that like, you know, the change and the freedom for people is so much more important than anything that I'm individually doing for it. And just being like, so like really excited to be caught up in that whole thing. And, um, and so I don't see it as, as sort of mine ever because it's not, and it never will be. And so just just feeling like really lucky to just say, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm getting to be a part of all this really. That's, that's a wonderful way to, to look at it. I, what I'm experiencing these days, I can't even begin to <laughs> express my gratitude and amazement with it. Um, started my own studio here and we're, we've been wanting to put together our, our first feature film. Now I'm 46. My, uh, uh, co-direct co-director co-producer is he'll be 50 this year and we're kind of like two guys pushing 50 with families and multiple jobs and we're like we need to make a movie we this has been our lifelong dream and finally i have the focus i have the mental aptitude and sort of uh clarity i guess you could say to do it and to put it together and just like you said this has to happen this is going to happen and that's the same attitude that i've taken and we've gone leaps and bounds in just weeks in getting you know we have to it's i'm sure you know 
it's not easy to raise money to do something like that, right? You're like, hey, who do I know that has money? Uh, nobody. That's great. So we're starting at zero. But your your book, your audio book, was one of the key factors that got me to a place where I could actually step up and say, I can do this. I don't have this these chains holding me down anymore. So I thank you so much for that. Oh, you're so welcome. That's awesome. I always thought there should be, I don't know if you've seen the documentary, um, truth about cancer. It's mm. like truth about cancer.com. You know this? Yes. Um, I always thought we should have like a truth about alcohol or a truth about addiction. So if in the future, once your movie's done, you want to talk about that, <laughs> I think that could be another just incredible thing. I agree. Really and, and you know, the, the, when you, you said, it's amazing that they say drugs and alcohol and they split it up that way as, as though alcohol is, it's something else. It's that you've got drugs and then you've got alcohol and it's, it's all the same. It's all, at least to me, it's all the same. Um, I, I don't want to take too much of your time. We're, we're coming up on a half hour now, but I, I can't thank you enough. And please, where, where can people find you the, the best all encompassing website that they can get everything that you're working on right now? Everything is at thisnakedmind.com. Okay. Thisnakedmind.com, Annie Grace. And you can find all of that on Facebook as well. And you're very active on there with sharing a lot of very interesting articles and, and a lot of, uh, of the research that you did is available for anyone that wants to look into it. If anyone, any doubters, because let me tell you, I've, I've done the AA, I've gone to counseling, I've um, had the inner battle for a long time, and <laughs> I listened to your audiobook, and suddenly I was like, huh, I guess I'm done. This is pretty cool. <laughs> it is fantastic. Um, I thank you so much for joining me on, on Positive Blatherings, and I wish you the best of luck with all of your future endeavors, and I look forward to seeing your next great work. All right. Thank you so much, guys. Great. Thank you.